What's good with the YouTube of Convict's Perspective? It's your boy, Big Flacco. Smashing, dashing, sliding on through. A little bit of energy, man. Hope everybody had a blessed holiday, man. We're going to get straight to it. Spit some content, man. And on today's subject, man, we're going to be talking about the Green Ladder Gang. Okay, we don't know a lot of information, right? We decided to research through a little bit of articles. And what we're going to do is there may be some discrepancies from, from what the article says, from the truth of these matters. So bear with us in mind. But at the end of this, we're going to still give our perspective on what we know of, of these green light gangs. No doubt, man. And uh, from the little bit that I do know, this sounds really in line with the basic generals of what was going on at the time. You know, some specifics may be interpreted by the individual writing it, by the individual who was living it. You know, everybody's got a different perspective, man, but we're going to try to bring you the realest, most authentic perspectives we always can, no matter what the topic is, man. So with no further ado, this first one, man, you know, this was a green light group, man. It's basically about the Lowell Street Boys. You know what I mean? The Lowell Street Locos. Is it Lowell or Lowell? Ah, man, I don't know how to pronounce it, man. I would think Lowell, but I'm not sure. No disrespect. That could be interpreted either way, depending. All right. They're predominantly Hispanic street gang located in the northeast section of los angeles law street boys started off as the clique of el sereno rifa in 1990 by a small group of teenagers that lived in the lowell street area and primarily hung out there this section of the territory was previously claimed by the loke or lock clique of sereno by 1992 lowell street boys refused to pay taxes to the local tax collector from Barrio El Sereno Rifa on behalf of the Mexican Mafia prison gang. Collecting taxes was a new rule in 1992. So the Lowell Street guys decided not to follow a rule that most of Los Angeles would eventually follow. The tax collector from ESR placed the Lowell Street boys on La Lista or green lighted, meaning that they were to become rivals of the rest of El Sereno and all other gangs affiliated under the Mexican Mafia umbrella. Being green lighted would mean that rivalries, rivalries from other gangs would increase. And if in custody, the low street gang members would be targeted in jail as well as prison. Following the green light, several El Sereno members conspired to kill the tax collector in 1992. But the leadership of the gang put 100% of the blame of that homicide on the Lowell Street boys. In December of 1992, Two of the Lowell Street members were stabbed in the Los Angeles County Jail, but they survived. The first death of a Lowell Street member since the green light was Jose Flaco Uribe, who was killed in the Los Angeles County Jail, stabbed to death several stabbed to death on February 6th of 1993. According to court documents, Jose Flaco Uribe was murdered by Joaquin Diablo Alvarado and Jorge Lopez. The murder occurred in the Los Angeles County Jail while all three men were inmates. The Mexican Mafia prison gang ordered Uribe killed because he was greenlit as a member of Lowell Street. According to the court documents, the state of California argued that Uribe was killed because he was a snitch, but the snitch label was a ruse created by prisoners to get everyone, excuse me, let me blow this up. Oh, bear with me, man. Bear with me. Created by the prisoners to get everyone on the chair to cooperate with the hit. Uribe was beaten and stabbed 37 times. And six months later, on August 13th of 1993, Alvarado, Lopez, and the third defendant, Frank Marquez, were charged with Uribe's murder. Uribe was the only in the county jail, uh, was only in the county jail for two days, and there was never any paperwork or evidence that Uribe was a snitch. Joaquin Diablo Alvarado from El Sereno was a personal friend of Jose Flaco Uribe and was ordered to kill Uribe because he was from the same community and he could get close to him without raising any suspicions in the jail. Alvarado was already walking in on thin ice because he was involved in a murder where he shot the wrong car on a stray bullet accidentally killed a 13 year old boy, Mario Martinez in 1991 for which he was awaiting trial. Because he killed an innocent boy, Alvarado would face sanctions in jail unless he killed Uribe, which he carried out. On April 28th of 1995, Lowell Street members shot and killed Mexican Mafia maid member Antonio Donito Rodriguez while he sat in a car in El Sereno. 
Although they were already greenlit, this homicide further strained their relationships with El Sereno and the Mexican Mafia, perhaps putting them on permanent greenlight status. Lowell members began to embrace the idea that they were greenlighted and used the term greenlight gang to describe themselves. Today, the gang's gang close to and active with very few members. They continued to operate until the early 2000s, but their presence has dramatically declined, perhaps because of the green light. In 2001, Lowell Street member Paul Ramirez was convicted of the 1999 attempted premeditated murder of El Sereno Lock Street member Carlos Pedrosa, as well as the driver. In 1997, Ramirez's brother Lawrence was murdered by Lock members. Forgive me how that sounded. I read it exactly as it was read. Interesting. So there's a little bit about, you know, where it came from, man. Everybody knew, you know, a lot of you guys know who know. It's all about money. You know what I mean? Especially in this situation with the Green Light Gang, everybody was calling themselves tax-free, Green Light Gang, whatever the case might be, man. And the reason why it all boils down to money, you know, like we, we, we hear a lot of things like Flacco as well as myself, like comparing them to the Bulldogs. And what do you think about that, Flacco? I don't say that. See you know what? Compare. I don't compare. Okay, look. You pull up, that, pull up that other article as we read. That other article is a good one, too, that elaborates on it, man. Okay. Um, personally, I have a whole different perspective of it, man, because the Bulldogs walked away because they were tired of being controlled out there in the prison. A lot of that was prison-based. It had nothing to do with the Gaius. You know what I'm saying? They were resisting the control of the NF and the, and the Northern structure at that time. Whereas these guys pretty much, as you're going to see in this other article that Roe was about to read, is they stood against the taxes that were being enforced upon them. All right, here we go. The Green Light Gang, the war between Maravilla and La M.A. has been raging since the early 90s. If you remember your M.A. history, Carnales were sent forth to organize all Southern California barrios under the Sereno flag. Part of the deal was that all Sereños had to pay taxes to the Carnales under penalty of death. Almost all barrios either willing or begrudgingly fell into line with the program and kicked up. But there were holdouts who basically told La Eme to pound sand. I'm reading it word for word. The Salvatrucha was one of those that declared themselves tax-free zones and immediately felt the heat. The Maravilla Varios also became tax-free and were later followed by Lowell Street. As a result, the Eme declared war on these Varios as always verde, giving the Sereños the green light to take care of any vatos from these non-tax-paying areas. With open war declared, the hardcore tax rebels decided to get even, and eventually all green light gang members who raised his hand to take care of a Sereno or a Carnal became known as a Marafioso. Now, I've heard that it's also different than that, but that's what I'm reading. A select few of those hardcore have now become known as the green light gang, and they were essentially a secret society whose members were only known to each other. Lowell Street and all the Maravillas over time have been strengthened by others with close to 20 East Side Larios being said to contribute members to the Green Light Gang. Claimed to be among those neighborhoods are said to be East Side 18th Street, East Side Clover, Cypress Park, making Northeast LA a hotbed of rebellion against tax and edicts coming from La Emme. The Green Light Gang is deep undercover because it is kept secret from the rank and file members of their own neighborhoods. And as an extra measure of security, the shooters in the Green Light Gang take pictures of themselves standing together. This is in order to discourage defection back to the Sereno side or betrayal to the Carnales. It's a David and Goliath struggle. The Carnales and Sereños have the numbers on their side, together with a lot of control inside as well as out. But on the other hand, a gang of hardcore shooters who can maintain a high level of secrecy and operate undercover can become a problem for the Carnales. The Green Light Gang is becoming the vanguard movement from the east side, which may well over time recruit enough members to define the enemy. I think some of those hoods, they, they, they've turned back, though. It's yeah. kind of interesting how, how the MAs operate. The articles from all of them damn near are turned back, aren't they? I think, yeah, I think a lot right. of them have pretty much fell under the... the uh, Any of you gentlemen in the comments, man, I know we got a lot of Southern support. We appreciate you for that, man. If you know if there's any holdouts among those type of groups, please let us know, man, because we're not 100% sure. Yeah, yeah, well, we know there was issues with 18th Street, man. A lot of those dudes tried to branch off and start the SSG back in the days. Um, Madavia was the biggest one I always heard. 
No, Madavia was always there. Uh, Madavia was pre, pretty much pre-associated. Man, I've heard stories about them, like I said before, about one time when they were in the yard uh, to Hatchby, they came across the Carnales, the structure members that were out there and wanted to, you know what I mean, sympathize as far as on the yard, and, and they were allowed to at that time, man. Um, but some of those other hoods, bear in mind, this that's an art, old article. I know the Lowell Street or Lowell Street, whatever you call it, right, is still a... Um, tax-free hood because that's the reason why i i looked up this this particular group was because someone commented and they were from low street or low street and they said they said a particular comment tax-free i'm saying so i did a little bit of research and i found out that they were one of the main hoods that was associated with this green light uh, uh, gang i don't know what the situation is with the maravilla i think it's 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 uh uh i think they're back in good standing you know what i mean yeah um but there's there's always been small hoods that have held out, bro. And hey, there's always in been. In case you guys don't know, Matavia is a huge area com comprising a bunch of different neighborhoods. So when you say Matavia, it's not one hood. For for you northerners and for you civilians who don't know, Matavia consists of a lot of different neighborhoods. It is an enormous hood when yeah. all put together. All of them independently are decent sized hoods. They're they're. You don't want them to not be on your side if you're one major group. We'll put it like that. They're deep. So I think the green light gang now is, is those that still align with those beliefs, from my understanding. People that are from those hoods that, you know, originally are from those hoods, but have a tendency to, they want to be tax free. I mean, because they're still in the system, bro. And a lot of them were being put on 50 50 yards. You know what I'm saying? Where they felt they were still active. They're kind of like how, how you said, you know, um, a lot of them are, are, some of them never debriefed. They never told, you know what I'm saying? They just can't go G GP. They go GP, it's going to be issues. It's going to be conflict. They're going to get booked. You know what I'm saying? Similar so to some, the of them, some, of them, some of them have expanded to the SNY yard. Some of them have been expanded to the 50-50 uh, yards. Some of them try to expand onto the main lines because they're not going to walk no yards. Same thing, it's the same thing kind of with the new flowers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, the new flowers actually have a yard over there in Salinas Valley Sea Yard, and they still function under what they would call active policies as active Norteños. They're not, they're only against the NF instruction. We've actually had a few conversations with, with someone that's actually active on that yard. Any new flower that's on the SNY side, they don't acknowledge. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's somebody that's I know since the 90s, so what he tells us is it's spot on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so with the green light situation, man, it, it just, it, a lot of them came back into the fold. You know what I'm saying? There's still those that are, that have held against the MA, and a lot of them are in bad standards. They've been hit, the green light's been put on them because of their past uh, uh, misgivings, so they have no even get backs. You know what I mean, I don't know a lot about them, but I do know that there's a lot of green lighters that, that are in the system, as there's as south siders, and they don't bang really sued or nothing like that. A lot of them, they're green lighters. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know what I came across? across? One of yeah. one of excuse me, sorry to interrupt you, brother. Somebody sent me a picture one time on Instagram that was from. Uh, I don't know what kind of yard it was. I, I don't want to say it's SNY. I don't want to say it's 50-50. I know it's definitely not the general population, though. There was three vatos with little green light bulbs tattooed on the back of their head standing next to each other, like, posing. Yeah. Like, man, you guys are serious, bro. <laughs> you know, well, it's been, got it's green it's, light bulbs tatted on them. It's all individuals. I mean, it's also became a situation to where those that fell out of graces, you know what I'm saying, with, with the MA, that have the green light put on them, they never did anything such as debriefing. They never had any funny style charges or something yeah. like that, man, but they fell out, out politically. Yeah. So they've kind of aligned to those beliefs. So there's a whole, you know what I mean? From my understanding, from my research, and, and you know what I mean? I don't have the answer to this. It's just from, from what I've gathered is that there's a lot of particular individuals and groups that have associated themselves with the green light gang. It's not just those that are from these hoods, as the article says. It's those that may be from any hood that got deemed no good. And they're like, you know what? F you guys, green light gang. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going this and why. You know what I mean? I agree, man. I agree. You know, and that, that's a lot of things that a lot of groups that are not groups, but individuals who, who leave for whatever reason or they're removed or kicked out. You know, they might have personal reasons why they do it. They might have been ostracized. But at the end of the day, they didn't debrief. They didn't tell. They didn't do none of this, none of, none of that a lot of people tend to group different types of dropouts, defectors, walkaways, NGNs, whatever you want to call them, as the same kind of groups. And that's not always necessarily the case. 
Are they all going to have conflict with the group where they originally stemmed? Of course. Are they looked at necessarily as straight garbage? Not all the time. Yeah, I've seen so you can't, point, bro. No matter how much you hate bulldogs, you can't look at them as straight garbage. They didn't tell. They didn't ask for protection. They went out there and handled their business. To me, I respect that personally, my opinion. Same thing with some of them. Some of them hoods in L.A., bro, you got a hood this big surrounded every square inch by hoods that have you on a green light. And you still didn't tell. You still didn't debrief. That's gangster to me, bro. You know, you might be looked at as bad, but you at the same time, man, you got to tip your hat, bro. You know, deep down inside, you still got to be like, hey, they got 100,000 people after them. They, they have two little blocks over here in northeast L.A., and they ain't, they're not buckling down. That's a lot of heat to have on you, bro, especially on the streets where everybody's got drums and, you know, them serenios are deep, bro. Man, imagine being green lit by seven gangs that, you know, border your hood. You can't go nowhere. Yeah. You're stuck. You better hope you got to go. You know what's funny? is it, it, during that whole thing, right? It's not funny, but it's just, it's something that kind of is interesting. When they had all this, this, uh, this new implementation of tax and all these hoods, right? Yeah. The no drive-by policy came out. But it applied to all these other hoods that were green-lighted. You can go do a drive-by on them. And the whole purpose for the drive-by shooting, shootings, you know, stopping it was to stop from innocent victims being hit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know a lot about them. I've never been on a, on a 50-50 yard. I've never been on an SNY yard. Um, I've only been able to gather from people I talked that were active in that lifestyle that can give me information. Yeah. So even though this, bear in mind, this article is old. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, that's our disclaimer. That it yeah, that's our disclaimer on it. Accurate. But there is, some, there is some facts behind these stories that these groups yeah. were at one time against the MA and against the taxation. You know, there was a lot of hoods at one time that were like, why am I going to tax people in my neighborhood and kick it, up, kick it up to the big homies? We might as well tax these people and keep it in our pockets. You know, and that's a big issue, man. Like anytime someone comes in and especially a lot of times you'll have dudes that, that are not from these particular areas that, that end up having jurisdiction. They want to collect the taxes in these areas, right? You as a group, you don't even know this person. And that, you know I mean, you're going to feel some type of resentment. Someone kind of, kind of trying to come into your hood and dictate what's expected of you. You know what I'm saying? That's why a lot of these particular groups from down that way, a lot of times you're going to have an individual who is from that neighborhood, who's a big homie to collect those taxes in that hood. It's always been a smart move. I agree. You know, there's, there's, there's always going to be, when it comes down to money, bro, and, and you know, you're, you feel like you're putting in all the work and you're only getting what somebody allows you to keep, you know, that's going to breed animosity, man. But at the same time, you know what you signed up for. There's always going to be rules people don't like and whatnot. It's a rough lifestyle, man. This is this is like today's lesson, man. If you want to get involved in these things, there's going to be things that you don't like that are way beyond your control. You know, if you're from a hood that's embraced by a group inside a prison, sometimes there's going to be little messages you get that you ain't going to like, that you really yeah. didn't sign up for, that you didn't know nothing about. You're going to learn and today. Some, and, some, and some of these guys are on S and Y yards too. Don't get it twisted on that aspect either, though. Yeah, some of them are out there on S and Y yards too. Yeah. You know what I'm oh, saying? yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I've heard I've heard there was a there was quite a there was quite a few, you know what I mean? That I don't know. Maybe that's what maybe that's you know, like their way of just staying all the way away. Just I'm just gonna totally separate myself and do whatever, like similar to the Northern Riders, you know what I mean? Who knows what every individual thinks, man? But there there's definitely green light gang on those s and y yards i've heard from people who've been there you know what i mean and there's 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 everybody for every different reason man you know there's you know a lot of ways, there's a lot of okay. ways to get in trouble green light red light green light red light that's the crazy part about it man you could be a green light and you could be out there riding for your hood say you from your hood right say it's 2003 2004 this is just an example guys and there's a green light on you guys and you just rock back you rock back you fucking go you, you, you know what i mean you put in that work Five years later, as you're doing your turn, your fucking hood fucking gets that red light put on it now. I mean, how does that work? You know what I mean? Hey, the big homies down there, just like the big homies from, from up north, they decide when it when it's on, when it's not on. And you you gotta respect it. 
you know what I mean? I mean, how many times up north has a green light been put out on any hood? I've 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 seen I've seen it in San Jose where they almost put Bon Moss on, on a green light back in 2006. You know what I mean? Roderick almost got it before. Who? Roderick. Roderick almost got it, yeah. Um West Side Mob had that little green light, then they you know what I mean, and then they put the little cleanup where they had they wanted them to take out a couple upstate Sudanos, you know what I mean, to for red on reds that were continuing out there. Um, I've heard of areas being put on freeze. Like I remember when Modesto was put on freeze for a minute, different areas like that, man. But it, it's it's kind of, you know, that's the difference between up north and, and down south is you really ever hear about any groups being a green light put up on them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I guess, but but you never had hoods really up north. I mean, besides the exception of Fresno, you've never had any hoods from up north that, that totally wanted to break away. The riders are a little bit different. The, the, you know what I mean? And the flowers are a little bit different. You know what I mean? The riders are, they're recruiting from anywhere. You know what I mean? They're recruiting from down south, up north. You know what I mean? White boy. You know, they're, not they're, recruit, they're not recruiting hoods. You know what I'm saying? To push their push their their their, uh, their movement. So it's a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, uh, the whole point of today's thing is when you sign up for stuff, things can happen. They can deem you. They can deem your neighborhood. They can deem you in specific for not following a specific instruction. Like when you got jumped into your hood, when you became a member of your hood, when you're banging this, banging that, you don't necessarily know all the ins and outs when you claim this name because they can change daily. You know, this week, this month, you might be subject to 10% of what your hood makes. Let's call that fair. Things might change. They might send down a new order. Man, we want half. Things like that can ruin whole careers, bro. So think about that on this gang level stuff. I know this is a very broad example, but man, when I joined the hood, I didn't know nothing about nothing about nothing like that. But would I have been held accountable if my neighborhood decided to say, meh, of course, of course. Maybe not me directly, but me being a member of that area just made me be no good for doing something that I didn't know from the beginning. Yeah, it's real easy. That's today's lesson. Know what you're getting yourself into. I'm not discouraging nobody from doing nothing. I'm not encouraging nobody from doing that. Just know what you're signing up for in full before you make a decision, especially the higher you climb the ropes. Easy enough. You would do that in a job. You'd want to know your expectations. You know, straight up. What do you think, Flocker? There's a lot of people, bro. I'm, that playing, thing, I'm, I'm playing a lot. Of, I'm playing a lot of things out of my head. I'm thinking about the difference, like between up south, down south, and up north. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the the you don't really have the options of making money out there, uh, say in Northern California. The homeboys that are uh, being targeted, what they're doing now is they're just they've been asking for contributions from certain hoods. You know what I mean? Two hundred bucks a month. You have a hood. That's not much. You know what I'm saying? Um, then you got those who are more actively involved out there, like, you know, anybody that's been ever pushing weight that puts on that red end hat, you know what I'm saying, represents that North Day is always going to be subject to what you call contribution. You're going to have to pay for protection of the mob. Yeah. You know, whereas down South is a little bit different. Anything you, your hood's doing or anything you guys are doing, the way that these hoods operate is, is, is because they're way more infested with gang members as opposed to what you see in, in Northern California. I mean, you could have a whole block of hoods but they're not as big. You don't have hoods where you have 200, 300 members. You know what I'm saying? Then where you have top tier members that are out there, you know what I mean? Where everybody's contributing something in the hood. You know what I mean? You know, where the Hispanic communities up North are a little bit more, you know what I mean? How you say it spread out. You know what I mean? You don't have like deep, deep hoods. Like, you know what I mean? So therefore they, they don't operate their functions different. I mean, you could sit there and freelance as a Northerner up North, and there's no way around that you're going to be getting that product majority of the times from the homeboys in general. So you just picking up that product from somebody, you're helping out the NF make their money out there, make their quota. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because there's going to, you're not going to be out there. So say say if I'm out there in the streets and I'm pushing five to 10 pounds of meth out there in a the week, there's another homeboy out there that's pushing three to five. We're all kicking in money. There's people that are working for us. So some is, It has a trickle down effect to where even if you're not doing it on a high level, there's no reason to tax the hood because people are kicking in money. You know what I'm saying? And so that's been the, the problem I've been hearing a lot lately is, is, is within the, the conflict between the two groups is one side, they started to tax a lot of people. Now they don't want to tax nobody out there. 
because they've seen the, the the adverse effect of trying to tax certain hoods and it just isn't working out. You know what I'm saying? If you can make people feel like they're contributing, right? That they're kicking in, that they're, they're, they're part of something without feeling it forced, you're going to get a lot more support. So I'm just playing out the differences between these groups because, and a lot of it I think is because the infested in numbers, the numbers are different as far as with these gangs. You know what I'm saying? You can go to San Jose today, right? I mean, you have different generations of, you have hoods that are deep through generations, but you can look, you can't look at any one hood that has more than 50 to 60 members per generation. That's a deep hood out there in San Jose. Usually they're going to be anywhere from like 15 to 30 heads. I know I lived out there. I know all these homeboys from these hoods and I'm talking generational, generational terms. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's not where you're like out there in fucking East LA or West LA and, and you have like 400, 500 members and you have to break it down in different factions. You know what I mean? These gangs almost are starting to operate like a chain of command too though. So that's the difference I see in, in looking at this is these hoods are deeper. So they have a lot more control in their territory. So then they want to infringe those taxes. Okay, if you guys are controlling your neighborhoods, kick in. We're in Northern California. These hoods are so widespread. They overlap each other. There's no like numbers that, that you would see in LA to where you can really control the area. Everybody wiggles a little bit more. You know what I mean, you could be like, say I'm using San Jose as an example because I'm from out there. I could be in East Side of San Jose and then I wiggle to the West. Then I wiggle to the South. You're not going to see that as much down South because everybody got their own shit sewed up. They're going to focus on their block, their hood. So that's the hey, difference I see in this. Do you think there's any hood up north that's deeper than Salinas East Market? I know they have a few hundred from their hood. For generation, you talking generations, or you talk? I'm talking about single generations because you got hoods like Horseshoes Deep, you got Palmas is Deep. You know what I'm saying? Those are like two of the oldest hoods in San Jose. Yeah, they got they got a lot of members, yeah. bro. You know what I'm saying? You saw from Michon got a lot of m- m- members, you know. 38th Street, Kinsey, you know what I mean? From Oakland, you know what I mean? I just, those, I just can't imagine those anything hoods all, deeper than Sam. No, I think, I think there is. I think there's some, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, Horseshoe's pretty deep, bro. Um, you know what I'm saying? Bob Moss has a lot of heads, too. You know what I mean? But I'm talking, you're talking generation, they have a couple hundreds. I'm talking about, like, per generation. Like, say, yeah, whatever it's hard, it's hard to grasp that. Yeah, you're right. You know, if, if you're, if you're, like, I've seen hoods where, like, the fourth or fifth generation, some of these hoods are, like, on their seventh, eighth generation, bro. And each generation has anywhere from 30 to 60 heads. I think the hoods back in the days were a little bit more deeper, like in the 80s and 90s, because you had less of them and they were deeper recruiting. And you had less less attention out there in the streets. You didn't have like sub pockets of, of gangs. Gangs became a thing. Colors, American Me, all these movies had a big influence up north. Where LA's all LA's always lived that lifestyle. Always. All the hoods that, that I'm really, really familiar with in, in, in you know, East East Cocoa County, they're, tw- they're 20 or 30, you know what I mean? VCN and Concord was, man, there was probably 50, you know what I mean? The only really, really deep one ever was CAL, and they didn't become, that's crazy ass Latinos out of Pittsburgh, they didn't really become deep until the 2000s, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, think you're saying per generation, there was about... BCN was you know, huge, bro. That, that's the difference big. between the gangs in LA and, uh, and up north is their generations have hundreds of members. Right, right. Where, right. where like, yeah, you mean you could go to you can go to Body of Horseshoe, you go to Bottom House, and they maybe have like about four hundred to six hundred members, maybe. But it's like through like six, seven generations. Each generation could be anywhere from like, and I think at, as at, this is what I'm, this is my personal opinion, right? And from what I seen and from what, what I witnessed, I was out there. I was in contact with each one of these neighborhoods at one time. Right. You know what I'm saying? As as we get further in, the numbers have lessened and there's been more hoods. So whereas back in the 80s, these hoods may have had 100, 120 heads, 80 heads. By my age bracket, it was like maybe 50 heads, 40, 60. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now it's even gotten even a little smaller because I'm hearing about hoods out there, man, that during my time era, they were out there. They were only like 8, 10 deep. Now they're like 20, 30 deep. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's it's a whole different evolution. And that's the difference between LA, San Diego, all these hoods down south and up north is because they have more huger numbers in their hoods. They're able to really, they really have blocks. They really have territories sewed up. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't uncommon for one homeboy to get jumped in the hood. And he lives like 10 minutes away, 10 miles away from that hood. It happens out there, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no doubt. All right, YouTube, man. I hope you guys had a Merry Christmas, first and foremost, man. You got to spend some time with your family. Santa Claus was had you on the nice list and all that good stuff, man. 
looking forward to rolling in this new year, bringing you guys some stuff, man. We're trying to get some interviews lined up, come up with some banging content for you guys, man. But we really, really appreciate all the love and support you guys gave us over the holidays, man. You guys went above oh, and beyond. Man. And that, that's very humbling. That's why I put that little short up about the word humble. You know what I mean? You guys have me speechless, man. I, I came in there for 15 minutes, man. And you guys made it the biggest live in the history of me and Flocko doing these lives. That's much, much, much appreciated. Anyway, a little bit about the green light, things of that nature. Some of these other groups, how hoods vary from city to hey. city. Hey, even though we do a disclaimer, Rojo, we're still going to have some of us going to come with a negative comment on us every yeah, fucking time. Hey, hey. All the every negative, time. All the negative comments, man, every time we give our perspective, it's only what we think. When somebody writes an article, it's from their very narrow understanding of that particular issue. All we try to do is comment on it based through our experience with dealing with groups hey. such as these. And, and, and even, court, even court documents and court cases, man. That's the same thing, man. There's a lot of misinterpretation. So if if people are drawing stuff from from, uh, uh, legal documents, legal reports and all that, right, there's going to be discrepancies in that too, people forget, man. It's not all factual based. Now, the things that we have experienced, that we have lived, the filters we've wrote or seen or passed, the communications we heard, the things that we are part of, those are going to come from a factual experience of our truth of what we went through, what we've seen. And we're able to take that and when we get information, we're able to expand our perspective of the things that we hear and what's going on in this world 100. or this life. So anyway, enjoy the rest of your day. Your boy Rojo will be on live probably about 7 o'clock as usual. I'll try to be punctual even. Imagine that. Have a good day, YouTube, man. We're out of here.